waiting for the recording to start. Great. So welcome to a new lecture on our course on deep learning for artificial intelligence. Today I will cover the topic of recurrent neural networks. And let's go for it. Let's put the pointer on. First, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Santiago Pascual and Marta Ruiz Costa Jusa for the help in, in preparing this lecture. And also, if you want to watch, especially their lectures on the topic, you can uh, check the video lectures from Santi Pascual and Marta Ruiz on the topic. The one that you see here from, from mine, I think it's quite similar to the one we will, we will review now. So first, the motivation. Um, let's start with some simple question. I mean, could you recall the fifth digit of your phone number? Or could you sing your favorite song beginning, beginning of the third sentence? Or what if I ask you to recall the 10th character of the alphabet? For this kind of questions or tasks, probably what you did is to go straight to the beginning of the string, whatever string that was, digits, words, numbers, and then just iterate over it, search through it, and to retrieve the piece of information that I was asking for. So these examples, they show how having an idea, a concept of the order, that's interesting. And remember that that's something that it's not explicitly encoded in the architectures we have seen so far. We saw multilayer perceptrons, we saw convolutional networks, multilayer perceptrons, they just have no idea, or like fully connected layers, they, have, they don't encode in, uh, in the architecture, any idea of neighborhood of the input samples, convolutional filters, they do, they kind of somehow encode the neighborhood relations of the samples that get into the filter and the ideas that, in addition to that, we are reusing uh, those uh, filters. But the nice thing is that it's, that it's kind of encoding somehow the neighborhood relation, but they don't really encode like what is fir first and what is next. Let's imagine that we want to solve a task in which the order of the samples, it matters. For example, imagine that we have a sequence of samples, that's what you have here. I would like to train a new network that will predict the next sample, the next value, so the next sample, by knowing all the previous ones. In particular, like Chao or I think uh, L, the last L samples. That would be maybe predicting the temperature for tomorrow uh, if we know the temperature from the last day. If we try to address this task with a fit forward architecture like a multilayer perception, or even a convolutional neural network, that's not mine. What we would do is you have at the input, it would fit the last, uh, in this case, L sample. So we have a window of, of size L. And then based on that, on the input in that window, we can predict the next value. That's what you have here, have the window size L, and then by looking at all the last values, you can predict the, the next sample. And in order to, we could actually apply that in any time of the sequence, and then just keep predicting the next sample based on what we have. That's it, like, we'll be like predicting always the temperature for the next day. So one question for you, what would happen if now uh, we increase the size of the window, L? What do you think it will happen with the amount of parameters that we need to learn? Let's consider multi-year perception. Does this, this is going to have any impact? Can you answer the chat, please? How do you think that the size of the window will affect the amount of parameters of at least, let's say, the first layer? Is it going to increase or decrease? OK, yeah, so as you write in the chat, the first layer will increase in the number of weights. Yeah, so actually, like, as many weights as the number of neurons in that in that layer multiplied by the the, the new uh, length, so the extension of the length of the input window. So that's going to produce a fast amount of parameters. But you notice that here we're trying is like to look farther, right? So just to predict not only on the last L sample, but more than this. What if we go, want to look beyond that? So there's uh, some problems uh, apart from having more uh, para parameters. There's another problem with also with using this uh, framework of having like a feed forward network. 
uh, and static window approach. Like one of them is that the decisions that we take, they are independent. Uh, so the, if we just take the last temperature values and we pick the, the next one, um, we, that decision will not affect about the decision that we'll take the day after. But what if, what if, I don't know, what if, if we would like to have some coherence you know, on the outputs that we are uh, generating, right? And also, um, when if we are doing that and, and we don't have enough samples to fit the input, uh, input, um, the input layer, okay, we need to put some some padding there, which may be a bit boring. It means that L is, is really large, and with the large the padding needs to be very 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 large, so very, very yeah of high dimension. Maybe we're going to fit like so many zeros inside, right? It's not like normally when we were thinking about convolutional neural networks, I know that. We, you use paddings there, but the padding it was just at the border, so most of, of the of the of the of the filter was kind of inside. That was the idea, and it was and it was something very local. Now, if the, the, the size of the window was large, this would be quite a big problem. If we, for example, if we don't have enough samples, but if we only have like a few of the samples. So, in order to address kind of limitations that uh, trying to address the processing of temporal sequences or sequences in general with uh, feed forward uh, neural networks, that's the motivation of uh, dealing with recurrent neural layers or, or networks, which kind of naturally address these limitations. Let's see how they do it. So now what we're going to do is we're going to generate a new set of weights, a new set of connections that connect each neuron in a layer with itself, but in the previous time step. So let's see how to think about that. Now, what we're going to have is at the input, not only one input sample, now we're going to have like uh, a sequence of input samples. So this means that if the input sample here is dimension three, we're going to have, now it's a sequence of input samples of dimension three. And in that case, this arrow that you see here, this connection that you can see, that's uh, describing the recurrency, the temporal recurrency. What it means is that, again, each of these neurons is not only connected to the previous layer, but this neuron is also connected to the state of itself and the rest of the neurons of the layer in the previous time step. Let's look at the formulation. Now, what we're going to say it's that the hidden state it does not only depend from the input this is what you already saw but now there's an extra set of parameters set of weights u that depend on the hidden state at the previous time step time step g minus one compared to the current time step that we are processing so this needs this new term over here that's what it described the recurrency. The, the rest of the formula is just the same as any other uh, fit forward polyparity layer you, is, you saw. You also have a bias terms. You also have a nonlinearity. That would be this F. And that would be, that's the idea of recurrency. Okay, you can think about that. The fact of, of having access to the hidden state in the previous time step is as somehow, somehow a way of having a volatile memory. When you have recurrent layers, you can combine them with other layers which are not recurrent or, or, or yes. Okay, that never mind. That's just something that is specific typically from, from all the neurons in the same layer. Yeah, so that's the basic idea of temporal recurrency. We can think about that we are having, as I mentioned earlier, is to have some kind of memory, right? We kind of remember what the hidden layer saw in the previous time set. If you look at the, in terms of parameters, in terms of number of parameters, of course, like having this additional temporal connection increases the amount of parameters. If we consider again, fully connected layer in which we add the recurrency, previously what we had is like, for the, 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 Mm, bottom up layer, we have these weights W that would 
the amount of neurons will be like the amount of inputs multiplied the amount of units or neurons plus the bias. And now, by adding the recurrency, we are increasing the amount of parameters because this, all these self connections, all these each of these neurons connected to itself, it increases the amount of parameters in n units multiplied by n units. So the number of neurons by the number of neurons. We are connecting each neuron, the neuron with all the rest of the neurons from the same layer, but in the previous time step. So having recurrency, uh, this kind of volatile memory, it comes with the cost because we need to uh, estimate also these parameters. Let's look at this uh, uh, scheme about showing how uh, vanilla recurrent neural network works. So vanilla means like the most basic approach for a, a recurrent neural network. What we would do is imagine that we have an input of dimensionality three, and we have a hidden layer of size two. And we want to express, like understand what's going on when we add these uh, connections. In this case, one way to understand it is like, now we have this set of weights of the layer. Some of them, the ones that are connected to the green input, they will correspond to W. While the weights that are connected to the previous time step, they will correspond oops, to the matrix U. So that corresponds to the temporal recurrence. So here, what I'm doing is I'm just putting all together the input state, the input uh, values at time step G, and the hidden state at the previous time step. So maybe these weights, it's easier to understand the how uh, the layer is actually implemented in practice. So this will be this G's. If you look at the gel legend on the right, uh, they correspond. It's written. Corresponds to the tangent yeah, here. T is a weighted sum of the inputs from the previous layer and activated with the tangent hyperbolic function. So in a vanilla RNN, we can consider that we have a tangent hyperbolic uh, output. Let's say that has like output between one and minus one in this case. And what we would have is uh, like the hidden state now, that's the output of this tangent hyperbolic activations that moves into the hidden state for the node for the current uh, time steps. Yeah, so now I'm going from left to right to mimic this uh, recurrency. Okay. Yeah, in, in addition, if there was another layer on top, we would have this on top as well. But now in this, in this scheme, I'm also focusing on the uh, temporal dimension that we could have like layers at each on top. Let's now look at this scheme with an animation so that you understand times of how it works. So we, we can the eight, we compute the tangent hyperbolic, and then we have the average. Yeah. Any question about this vanilla RNN? Okay, I'll just check that, that there is no question. Let's move forward then. Um, of course, as in any uh, neural network, what we want to do with these models is to estimate the parameters that will uh, help us into solving the task. If the task is to predict the temperature for tomorrow, okay, that's going to be our task. We will collect a data set of temperatures. We will, uh, based on the, on, the, on the previous temperatures, now we can predict the next one. The nice thing with recurrent neural networks is that now we don't need to specify any size of the input window. We just can train with all the samples that we have. And also do the inference. They can remember anything. We don't have. We need a fixed size window of the input. Okay, we have a question. Great. It says the values that are used are after the activation function or before. Okay. When you say the values that are used, I'm not sure what you mean. I would say it's after. So that's the output of the tangent hyperbolic. That's what goes um, here. Yeah. So because maybe I, I should show the yeah, the formula again so what, from the question i think to understand is like so the hidden state which is what we have seen so far that moves into the next layer that's what we'll, we will send to the next layer to be propagated to the network if, if there's any difference between the hidden state that you send to the layer on top 
with respect to the hidden state, let's say, that, that we send to the next time step? If that's the question, that's what I understood, the answer is that no, it is exactly the same. That like all these arrows that you see over here, they are exactly the same that is being represented by this arrow. And from the other skin, uh, okay, the other skin here, you don't you don't have any layer on top. This is this will be like the temporal currency that is depicted. But this this output, or this output if you want, you can think that it's sent to the next time step or also to the to the layer on top. Did I answer? Another question says, could you store more than one previous tapes and concatenate them to the current state? That's a very good uh, point. The answer is yes, you could do it. That's uh, actually something we comment later in the in the slides as a, some kind of advanced architecture. So that's what you can do. Uh, so there's a work that says that you can obtain some gains there. But uh, two things here to take into consideration, like, if you do that, that's something you can do. That will first, it will require more parameters to estimate, which makes the training harder. And also, let's say, the whole idea of, or the concept of temporal recurrency or, or recurrent layers is that you actually don't need to do that. that. That if there is something useful, let's say, two time step before, so that you use it at time step G, if there's something useful, like further than one step before, uh, this something, this in useful information should be able to propagate until the current time step. So that when you train a network, that information that maybe you saw some samples, input samples before, it should be present in the hidden state that, uh, in the state, in the state that you are using to, sorry, to be encoded here. So if there's something in interesting in, in time step T minus two, it should arrive here. And okay, that's that's a theory. And I know that and it has some problems. Now I will explain them, but that's that's a very good one. Great. Thanks for the questions. Very good questions. Uh, feel free please to pose your question. That makes things much more interesting for everybody. Um yeah, I was talking about yeah, training, how to train this. Because now we don't we don't need to we're not training uh, across the, the depth of the layers only, but we are also like going to train through time. Let's see what I mean with that. So before trying to explain how we train that, let me explain uh, the type of visualization that we normally use when dealing with uh, temporal sequences and with recurrent neural networks. So let's consider the logo from UPC. That would be a front view of the logo, okay? And if we do this kind of 90 degree rotation, that will rotate into a side way, side view, sorry. Okay, now let's do the same with this layer that we have not always used them, seen them like this way, frontal face, and where chime in this case, I would go against the screen. When when we do something that's called the unfold, when we unfold a recurrent neural networks, it's like having a rotation of 90 degrees of these neurons. And this is like the unfolded representation of, for example, this layer. Notice that before chime was against the screen, and it goes from left to right. And here, even if you only see one neuron, actually, that's not true. There are like, in this case, uh, three more neurons behind this one. They are just so well aligned that we don't see them. It's, like, it's the same as the bulk of UBC, okay? So if, when, if we don't plot them, always remember that behind this neuron, there are like, there's a whole layer of neurons. Okay, so now I'm going to use this side view for the next slides, okay? Where time goes from left to right. So let's think about the forward pass of a recurrent neural network. In a forward pass, if we look at the unfold version of the recurrent neural network, what we have now is input data, x, t minus one, t, t plus one, and the outputs. So now you have input data that's being fed here, that it affects, let's say, the, the output. If there was like, if this was already the output layer, 
that will be the output. We could have like as many, we could, we could have more layers here on top, okay? Just to make it easy, we have uh, one hidden layer, one output layer, in this example. So now this input value, it affects, of course, y at t minus one, but it also has the potential to affect the outputs over here and over here. Yeah, because it can propagate to the temporal recurrency. It would propagate this information, will propagate through the hidden state of this um, layer that is connected to the next time step with a set of weights u. The sets of weights, they are kind of fixed. That's something that we learn. Okay, so we have, this will be like the weights on the first layer, the weights on the output layer, and the weights u for the recurrent layer. So now notice that as we have also the temporal output, we have like the depth in layers, but also the temporal depth. So in terms of uh, formulation, just to insist on the formulation, in orange, you have this output, the, the, input, the input data that flows to the W parameters. In red, the matrix U connects in China. And yeah, that would be it, right? That's, that's the, the parameters. Okay, what about uh, if instead of doing the forward pass, we focus on the backward pass. So that's this backward pass that we do from the gradients. It's kind of the same thing, but now we go from the output to the to the input, right? Remember the gradients, but we saw so far, uh, we're uh, computing the gradients of the loss function with respect to the parameters of the, of the model. And now uh, we do the same, but before we just, we only had the depth uh, of the layers to backpropagate, and now we also have time to backpropagate. That's why in recurrent neural networks, we also have something that's called backpropagation through time, the PGG. In this case, the training method must take into account the different types, time steps. So let's look at this example, right? Now again, we have um, these um, four, four input samples, okay? And in this case, uh, we are computing the errors at each time step. This will be like error or loss function. It's, it's the same. So this will be like the loss function of the prediction of our of our, our network at this time step, at this other time step, this other time step. Let's take back the example of the of the temperature. Remember that um, we are trying to uh, predict the the temperatures, okay, uh, for the next day. So this imagine that the output were the temperature for the next day. And then we put that at the input, like let's see the, the temperature for, from from today, and we want always to have at the output the temperature for tomorrow. Okay. Then in that case, as we have a training data set, actually we 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 know the the actual temperature for tomorrow. So we have a data set of of temperatures. We say like we know the data if we given the the temperature for the input temperature for day zero, okay, we play the, the temperature for, for that day zero and we compute the error, and we could do that for all the, all the time steps. In our cases, we could, uh, for example, compute the partial derivative of the error with respect to the weights of the layer. In this case, it will be the partial derivative of, the, of these uh, parameters of the hidden layer with respect to the previous time step and so on. So the gradients, they, can, they will still backpropagate, but now not only in this direction, but also across time. So what it's telling us is that now, when we compute uh, the gradients, we'll need to add all the gradients of all the errors in which our sample was, uh, was used, was considered. There is something here to take into account, which is uh, practical which is that in practice, even if, the, let's say, the theory, the theory would, would allow to, to deal, to train with sequences of any length in practice, because this is going to be quite demanding in terms of um, memory, because we need to backpropagate through time in addition to the layers. In practice, what we're going to do is to train 
with sequences of, of limited length. And that's going to be a parameter that will fit into our networks when training them. When you do, you will do a lab on recurring on networks, and you'll see that the sequence at training time, the training batch, it will have a fixed size. So for example, in Keras, it's one of these deep learning frameworks that exist. There is a parameter called sequence length that you need to fit when training. And you'll see that in Python or something similar. Okay, so it's, it's not true that when you train, if we have uh, very long sequences, you will be using a very, very long um, back progression through time. In practice, you will see that in, in order to make it feasible um, to train, you will need to, to take pieces of sequences. But that's something that it's a computational limitation. It's not, it's not from the concept. The concept, in, in theory, should be able to compute uh, to back, back propagate gradients across all the sequence. Okay, problems with uh, back propagation through time, which is kind of connected to the question that you posed. Um, so first, um, actually, I think that's more related to the to the forward pass, which is like in the forward pass. Uh, remember that um, what you have is the input value. So here, it back propagates. Uh, earlier, I was asking like when you have this input value, that's going to affect the output here and the output here and the output like in any other output. But this input value at each time step, it needs to go through this layer with whatever weights and in addition to the nonlinearities. So actually the input value that you have here, like step after a few steps, steps, it has maybe kind of vanished or it kind of has been kind of forgotten There's because it has been kind of modified, right? So earlier when you were asking like, uh, could we use the, pre the previous steps from, from, from even earlier? Uh, that would be a reason to do it because I, uh, so I answered, I mean, in theory, you, should, you shouldn't, you don't need to do it, but as there are some nonlinearities that will be modifying, kind of distorting, let's say the input values, this might be a good idea. So this problem, it's called the problem of long-term memory that in recurrent neural networks it kind of van vanishes quickly because these recursive operations with nonlinearities you have especially these nonlinearities in addition the weights that are kind of transforming the data okay so when you, you are you are looking at the output at time step g and this uh time step g it may depend from of course the input at this time step but also for the output from the hidden state that will be this part that would depend from a few amount of previous time steps, let's say uh, until T, T capital, capital T. So these three points here, they can contain actually many nest, nested uh, Gs, which in the end, they are going to affect how X is in GN, let's say, seen by the hidden state at time set G. And that's a problem. And it's a, that's a limitation of, of, of this kind of architecture that I'm showing that where the, the memory is the memory is already fed into the nonlinearity. So it's it's the non that is the nonlinearities they may affect uh, this how the bevel, how the memory is stored totally. In addition, if we look at the back propagation part and we, when we are back propagating gradients, um, th this kind of having like a, a layer which is much deeper than the regular ones. And this may produce things like if the gradients, they, they become uh, large, Jordan one, uh, they can kind of grow, grow, and keep growing because there's a, this multi multiplicative factor of the gradients with the, with the derivative, okay, of the function. It could happen that uh, the experience may explode and then the, the, system, the training doesn't converge. Or the other way, maybe, Again, as there's this multiplicative factor, it could happen that by adding this, especially this temporal uh, depth, that the vanishes, the gradients vanish. And again, that's that's a that's a big problem. So actually, by vanilla RNNs, the one that I'm showing you now, uh, they are really really difficult to train, especially because of that, because vanish, uh, gradients tend to vanish and explode, and in addition, uh, they the the information they 
it's kind of lost through the nonlinearities. So this limitation uh, brought to uh, modifications of the basic idea of recurring on uh, um, layers of networks into other architectures. And two of them are especially popular. Uh, they're called LSTM or all group GRU. These architectures, they are called gated architectures because you see that they introduce uh, some neurons which are called gates and that um, kind of control that the gradients don't explode, vanish, and the memory is it's better preserved. Let's, let's see how it looks like. So let's focus first on the LSTM, long short term memory. That has been a work that was published uh, in 1997, so it has been quite a, a long time, like as in many other algorithms that are being used in deep learning. It was proposed by the team of Hugo Smith Hoover, one of the uh, contributors on deep learning, and actually like he has uh, this uh, post in which he uh, kind of provides an overview of the contributions that he and his colleagues or people that he considers that were pioneers uh, proposed, okay? And sometimes there's, there are some discussions about the originality of some of the contribution of deep learning. He has like this blog post in which uh, he shows his views. I invite you to check a look at them. So he's a well-known um, figure in deep learning. He's, uh, uh, four years ago in Barcelona, there was this conference, uh, New Rips, and the, the room was really full, but a lot of people, people couldn't get in, there were safe, safety guards at the door, not letting people in. And in that time, he kind of, kind of uh, presented, or, or not presented because it had been running for 20 years already then, or um, 15 years then, I think. I don't know, for a long time, uh, uh, long short term memories have been there. And now he was saying, hey, we, we have proposed this model for quite a long time. And now, uh, so he proposed it with his, at that time, PhD student Sepp Hochreiter. He's saying, and now, Nowadays, uh, it's being used by all the companies to do to process um, sequences. So, especially to, to deal with speech or language, which are uh, very natural forms of uh, sequences. And at that time, 2016, they were mostly processed with these architectures. So, let's look at the architecture of LSGM using the same color codes and schemes that we used earlier. As you see now, the first thing you should notice that there are uh it's more complex than the architecture that we saw earlier so that's the first thing to observe but there are some points in common first point in common we have the input over here we have the previous hidden state over here and we have the next state hidden state over here also there's one piece that it's the same which is this one okay that will be like the same vanilla rnn so you should interpret it in the, in the same it will be like like the core vanilla the core uh, the core layer let's say in addition now we have two uh, main elements first element is what's called the cell state somehow what we are trying to do is to keep the memory that we want to keep safe separate from the hidden state that it's deciding uh, what's being propagated for the next time step so this cell step that you think about it's a uh, memory and it's modified in two ways. So first, this, this first point in which this modified and it's connected to what's called the forget gate. So these gates, notice that now there's an S at the output instead of the tangent hyperbolic, okay? This S refers to sigmoid. It's written down here, okay, very small, but it's a sigmoid. So remember, sigmoid are these gates that whose output go from zero to one. So what's telling us here is that we are going to look at the input in green and the previous hidden state in red. We are going to train uh, parameters of a, a fully connected layer with a sigmoid activation. And that each of these values, in this case, we're considering a cell set of dimension two. In practice, they are going to be much larger, but just to make it easy, we put dimension two. And we're going to multiply these two values by the contents of the cell state. The idea is that this uh, forget gate, it should um, tell if the cell state should be deleted or not, how much it should be kept or not. So if, if it was a zero, let's say, 
uh, that would multiply by zero the contents, it would totally delete what comes from the from the previous time step in the memory. If it was a one, it would totally move forward. So actually, earlier when you were asking like, how could, you, could we uh, connect something to the previous state? So this way, notice that uh, we are providing a path by which the state, the memory, can propagate forward, can move forward without any non-linearity. Okay, so we are kind of solving the problem that the hidden state that the memory must pass through. So this problem that I was noticing earlier, earlier here, that the that the self state must go through the, the weights and the non-linearities. We are we are providing a path that allows a memory to uh, flow with no modification. So if, if this was a one, if, if those outputs outputs were one, and okay, there's an, something else here. There's this other part addition in which what we are doing is we are modifying the cell state also by addition but uh, with something that comes from the gate that it can be like the core the vanilla of the vanilla rnn so that would be like whatever information we are trying to learn okay the output from the tangent hyperbolic but this output again is multiplied by another gauge this gate that's called the input gate so actually the gate is this one and it's, and it's controlling how much of the current input of, of the current input in the sense of the output of the layer, the actual layer um, based on the input uh, data. So how much of the current sample it's kept, it's saved into the cell state. So again, let's put the extreme cases. If this was a zero and this was a one, the cell state would totally be replaced by the contents of this, uh, of the regular input gauge. I mean, the gate is so for, so for the regular input uh, layer, let's say, because the, the gate is this part. Okay, when it, we multiply, that's a gate. Yeah, so by doing that, we, I mean, in the extreme case in which uh, said this is one and this is uh, zeros, the cell state, in that case, that would move with no distortion the next time step. So there, there is a method, there's a, a path by which the memory could be totally safe, let's say. Yeah. Also, um, like we're still missing one more. So we have the cell shape. And then uh, what we need is to have some output for the next hidden state that moves into the, this side. So now in this case, in order to compute uh, the next uh, hidden state, we can do uh, that comes from this output gate that it checks the cell state, it fits it through a tangent hyperbolic, okay, and then it's uh, I think it means the, the inverse I think that it's the inverse of tangent hyperbolic, and then it multiplies it to compute the uh, the next hidden state. I will, I will look at the formula, I don't remember if that's the inverse or, or the tangent hyperbolic. Maybe it's the arc tangent hyperbolic. I, I say for the for the color code. Okay, so in GM, uh, we have one gate that tells how much of, a memory, of the memory it's going to move forward, the forget gate, another gate that explains how much of the of the actual layer it's to, it's to be safe into the cell shape. And then another final gate, or actually over here that tell us how the cell state is going to uh, contribute or how it's modified into the next uh, hidden state based, again, remember that this from this side, we are having the hidden state from the previous time step and also from the input. So that's actually in the end, that depends uh, also on, G, on the input values. Here you have the animation of the of the layer. Have the forget gauge. Now the input gauge. We modify the cell state, and then finally we compute the new hidden state. 
this is another visualization of the uh, LSTM that maybe you will find because it's quite popular from Christopher Olaf. In this case, what I want to uh, emphasize is that uh, all this process that we saw with the sigmoid uh, gates, that is hyperbolic and the other sigmoid gates, uh, it's, it's executed at each time step. Remember that now time goes from left to right. Okay, and that we have for the next layer on top, we have uh, the hidden state goes uh, to the next time step, but also to the layer on top, if there is another one. In terms of parameters, uh, notice that now, not only we have the recurrent uh, layer, but now we have three, three gates. So in total, compared to a, to a, a fit forward fully connected layer of, of, of the, those amount of, of neurons, we are multiplying by four the amount of parameters that we need. Okay, these are SGM or the next one grew implementations that I show. These are like the practical implementations of the concept of recurrent neural networks because by introducing these gates, that's what stabilizes the training and then it makes it's possible to train recurrent neural networks with with this trick. Without these gates, it's very unstable. It's very hard to train them. In case you want the formulations, here you have the formulations. Uh, okay, I think now we can look at the tangent hyperbolic. Okay, no, it's not a inverse. I was wondering earlier. It's the it's always the tangent hyperbolic for the for the output gate, which is this one. Here you have another representation. Uh, what we saw earlier. So we, we start from the the input. Uh, that's what the input gate, that's the update of the cell state. This is the forget gate. This is the, the update of the cell state combining the input gate and the forget gate. And this is the output gate. With that, uh, you combine, you, and then you, you multiply by the tangent hyperbolic of the cell state. So in the end, uh, that's tangent hyperbolic. Okay, so that would be uh, for the LSTM. Then there's another architecture which is quite similar to LSTM that has a few less parameters. That's called uh, GRU. It kind of follows a similar uh, approach a strategy. Just that uh, I just want you to remember now that it, it has one gauge less, so it has a few less parameters to train. So maybe that's a good option if you want to play with it. Here you have the scheme. I will not go through this in, in detail, but it's kind of I just it's a similar spirit, maybe a bit more complicated to understand, but you can like take a look at the paper if you are interested. Then some uh, ideas that I want you to just to conclude this lecture to be aware. First of all, the stat RNNs, as I mentioned earlier, nothing prevents you to, to from having one layer of recurrent neural networks on top of another one. You can have uh, depth uh, in terms of layers as well as depth in time. That's something we, we can always do, okay? Of course, always remember that recurrent neural networks, they have, uh, they require more parameters and that that's going to be demanding in terms of memory and later to estimate uh, gradients. Also, there's a scheme which is very popular, which are called bidirectional RNNs or BRNN, in which uh, instead of just fitting the sequence in, in, let's say, in the increasing order of indexes, so from left to right, that would be the forward layer. If we have a training time or even an inference time, like the whole sequence already, so it's it's not that we are doing processing anything live, but it's something like uh, data that we have recorded. We can also like fit, uh, try to solve the problem by looking at the samples in the opposite direction. Yeah, so we can predict, let's say we could predict the, I don't know if that's very useful, but we could predict the temperature from yesterday based on the future temperatures. I'm not sure that's very useful as a study case, but that's what it's telling me here, okay? So we can have like this layer, that's what I was been talking about all the time, going from T minus one, T and T plus one, but also we could have another layer that takes the opposite direction. And maybe just to have the output predictions you want to you want to combine the hidden states, yeah. For example, you imagine that you want to predict uh, 
if there's an activity, you're doing computer vision and you want to predict if there's a person jumping, maybe you, it's, it's as easy or difficult to, 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 to predict if there are person is jumping if you move forward into the video or if you move backward. Okay. And maybe like combining both, both directions that's going to, to help, especially to find the boundaries in which the person start jumping and end jump. Just to conclude some advanced architectures. Um, first, I would like to break this idea sometimes uh, you tend to have that one architecture can be convolutional or recurrent. That's not the case. You can have, so convolution means that it's something local in very good translations. Recurrent means that it, it, it's, uh, it's processing a sequence. So it has a notion of what has seen in the past. You can have convolutional filters that have remembered what they have seen if the input is a sequence. Okay, that's called COMLSTMs or COMBRU that nothing prevents you from, from doing that. Um, okay, I think this one also, it's kind of, um, you can, if you have like stacks of layers, you can actually like uh, fit the stacks on the previous time step also at the beginning of the next layer. That's kind of called a uh, variation of architecture that was uh, tested to uh, learn to, um, analyze videos and that kind of helped a little bit. So because in the end, like the hidden state that comes over here, it uh, has also seen the last state from the previous time step and that may help but for some task. Okay, this architecture is the thing that uh, you were suggesting on the chat. So notice like how now for time step G, we have access not only to time step G minus one, but we are also having this connection T minus two and this other connection with T minus three and all the rest. So you can have this kind of skippish connection. Again, this requires more parameters to learn, um, but it can bring some, some gains. You can check a look at this at this paper. Also, uh, some, some architecture we proposed here at UPSA was proposed with mostly by uh, Victor Campos. Uh, we have some uh, case called skip RNN, in which what it learns is to skip input sample. So imagine that we have an input sample, we read it, we have a state, so we have a, a state for this Input sample, and now the neural network can decide that that in order to solve whatever task, it doesn't need to read the next sample. So, for the in practice, what we do is we copy the state. If the network decides to skip an example, we just copy the state. We don't read. We don't read the next sample, and then we can have an output that will depend from the same state. So the output will be the same one. But we are not reading this this sample, and that's very important in terms of efficiency, because sometimes reading, sam sometimes reading samples that takes a lot of computational time. And then maybe in this example, the neural network would decide that he would, he would like to skip one sample, so it skips this, reading this sample, and then for the next time, decides to read this one. So it's important that the network, <coughs> sorry, decides which samples to skip based on the data. For example, look at, this, at these examples. Here, what we did is we were uh, solving MNIST classification, but not with a conversion neural network, but by flattening all the pixels of MNIST and then by just reading each pixel individually. So now the samples will be the pixels from MNIST. Okay? This again, this is a, a, a case for research, not that this is the best way to solve MNIST. You know that this is much better with conversion neural networks. But here, what we want to solve is if we can classify, if we can uh, know which is the digit that we want to classify without looking at all the pixels. So you can see like the evolution of the training of our network. And if you look at, at, the, at the end of our training, you can notice like how uh, the skipper name, our model learns to not watch the first pixels, especially focusing the central part. And then probably at the end, there's nothing much more to, to see. And also that the pattern of the pixel that it reads, it really depends on the content. So it's taking the decisions dynamically. And this allows like saving a lot of computation because for each of these blue pixels that you see, that means that the pixel was not read, we are saving the computation. Maybe this is case of uh, reading pixels, computation is not that important, but imagine that what you're trying to do is to uh, analyze a video sequence and you want to analyze a video sequence with First, you extract features with a convolutional neural network. That's a very common approach. And later, you feed that into a recurrent neural network just to be able to capture the, the sequence. So every time you feed a frame into a convolutional neural network, there's a lot of computation. 
if we can skip tracking these features, that's all the computation we can save. For example, here you see some video clips that we generated in which the, the activity, the, the task was activity detection. So say which activity is going on here. And in green, you see it's marked the frames that uh, were seen. So you know, the frames that were actually analyzed to a network. So we can save a lot of computation time. Just to finish, I give you like some ideas of applications that in which recurrent neural networks have been widely used. Um, so first I will introduce this idea of encoder and decoder applications uh, in which, let's say, if we can encode um, images or text or, or speech or audio into some learner presentation and then decode also from a learner presentation, image, text, uh, audio, uh, speech, there are a huge amount of uh, new possibilities that we can have and that has been much easier to do thanks to deep learning. So now I'll focus about this kind of schemes, especially exploiting recurrent neural networks. <laughs> so one of the uh, first applications of recurrent neural networks was into first encoding uh, sequences of words or language. Imagine that we have a sequence of, of words. Each of the words is encoded with a one pot encoding vector. That's what there's only one black sometimes uh, cell that would correspond to the to the word. Of course, if there was language, it would be much longer, but let's say it's a one pot encoding. We learn some uh, word embeddings with a language uh, model. So it's a small dimensional representation that can be learned with some um, self-supervised tasks. Maybe I'll, I'll talk about it later, but there are ways just to have like a, some compact representation for each word. And now, the important thing here is like this compact representation for each word, you feed it as input to a recurrent neural network. And now we have chime from left to the right. And we take, so we feed the whole sequence, economic growth has slowed down in recent years. So we feed that into a recurrent neural network and we check the final state of the current neural, neural network as the representation for the whole sentence. So we can think that the whole sentence is encoded into the representation. Remember, I will insist again, that even if you see a single circle here, there are like, so that's a dimension, that's a vector that goes against the screen. So it might be as, as, as long as 300, 500 dimensions, which is, would be like the, the dimension of this word embedding. Okay, so you can think about of this representation, it's kind of, uh, get, okay, N not necessarily this length. So the, just imagine that the hidden state of the recurrent network, there are like many uh, neurons behind this, each of these circles that you see. So we have one vector that encodes the whole sentence. What can we do now? What we could do is, for example, train a neural network so that this representation layer can be decoded into another language. For example, La Croissant's economy so in this case, what we are doing, we are pretty, we are decoding this presentation into another language. And again, we are using at this stage, that's the important one for today's lecture, this is a recurrent neural network. You fit the representation, it predicts a word, la, we fit the prediction that it, that it obtained as an input for the recurrent neural network. So we have the state, you have the input for the recurrent neural network, so now it can predict the next word will be like croissants. Again, this uh, word will somehow encode it into the recurrent neural network, and then it can predict another word. And basically, that's how it works. And that's how, notice that we can go from English, economic growth has slowed down in recent years, into French, just by, by encoding the whole sentence in a sing, into a single representation. So by doing that, we can go and solve machine translation. That's how machine translation has been uh, solved in a neural fashion. And that's how uh, for many years, not sure nowadays if it's still it's like being done like this, but that was the beginning of uh, machine translation with, with deep learning. What if we can encode speech? So we can encode speech as well with recurrent neural networks here. I think you can understand somehow that there are like, here these inputs are speech samples bidirectional recurrent neural networks in two layers, well, in three layers actually. And then we can we can look at the these hidden states and encode 
the speech this way, the recurrent neural network, because in the end, speech is a sequence of samples. So we can encode uh, speech with recurrent neural networks, so sequences of, of any length, that's super important, any length, because kind of the recurrency that cannot mix the encoding invariant to the length of the input sequence, then later we can uh, go and decode checks. We can maybe given some speech, we like the spectrogram of audio, we can fit it into a recurrent neural network and that it predicts, in this case, this will be a, a decoding of character by character, but it will predict. Uh, so you have like for different outputs of the softmax, and the different letters that it may predict. The last one is end of sequence. So it will predict hello, right? So the, the darker color, it may mean like the, the predicted character. Um, what about if we use use it to encode? So sorry, not for encoding speech, but for decoding. Again, we can use recurrent neural networks for that, like this work from uh, uh, sample RNN, and we can uh, do speech synthesis. We can fit um, text into an encoder and then decode speech. Speech. Yeah, let's put this speech synthesis and something a bit. Different now. I'm in, going to encode image, and I'm going. I'm not going to use RNN for images because you already saw with Veronica that that's not the best idea, and that convolutions are pretty good. But we can combine architectures. We don't need to have like the, the encoder and the decoder to have exactly the same type of layers. We can have an encoder, an encoder that uh, it's based on convolutional neural networks, and then a decoder that it's a recurrent neural network, and then we can have like system that will predict sentences so sequences of words uh, match with an image this would be like examples of image captioning which for this image we would have captions like a group of people shopping at an auto market or there are many vegetables at the fruit stand so that could be it for uh, this crash course on recurrent neural networks uh, i invite you if you want to learn more to look at this um, blog post or documents online that you can find all these videos as well from other instructors. As I, as I mentioned, no. okay. And now I'll stop the recording in case you have any question, you can totally pause it.